Do any of you know Jeff? You know, Jeff. He's the guy in charge of your API. Maybe he's your API manager or your product manager. Maybe he's your CTO or your developer evangelist like me. You know, Jeff. He's the one who comes to you and says, listen, we need a client library. Anybody who's anybody has a client library. We need to have that relationship with our users. And you say, Jeff, our API looks something like this. It's pretty much a one-trick pony. Our developers are fine with string requests. I'm not spending energy and resources on a client library. And Jeff is kind of forced to agree, and he goes back to whatever he was doing, which is probably harassing your developers. Jeff. Now, you may not know my Jeff, but you've probably been involved in some conversation like this. Because this is a universal conversation, a story that repeats itself, that tells of discussions that we have about how to create relationships with our developers. And so it doesn't matter if it's Jeff or Jennifer or Vladimir. What's important is that we're having these conversations. My name is Avital Tsubeli, and I'm from Kaltura in Tel Aviv. I actually spoke at the Nordic Austin conference a couple months ago, and I noticed this recurring statement. Developers are people, too. Right? <laughs> now, I tried to go to as many DevEx uh, talks yesterday that I could be in at the same time, and I heard similar ideas, but not these exact words. And I wonder, is it because we already got the point or do we need a little bit of reminding? And what does that statement mean anyway? Today we're going to speak about automatically generating your client libraries, not for the fact itself, but as a powerful tool for creating those relationships with those developers who are, in fact, people too. Those developers who you want using your API and staying loyal to your API because of your up-to-date client libraries. We'll talk about homemade solutions and generic solutions. We'll talk about how to do that in a way that is easy for your development team and feasible for your business, because you have other things to worry about. Let's get back to Jeff. It's about a year or two later, and Jeff, who is now about 10 years older in spirit, comes back to you. Your API looks like this now. And he says, this is ridiculous already. Our developers are suffering from absurdly long string requests that look like this. The community is complaining. It's taking forever to integrate our API. Our relationships are in shambles. We need a client library. And you say, OK, Jeff, fine. Let's have a client library. What do we have to do now? Now, hopefully, you didn't have that part of the conversation. Hopefully, you thought this all through when you were creating your API, which is what Kaltura an open source video platform, was doing about 10 years ago when we were writing our API. And we realized that it would end up really complex with nested paths that complicate the data model, uh, especially with all the objects we have being thrown around. And so what we did was we packaged all, this, all the services that we have in the system as objects, and all operations that you can perform on those objects as actions, which means that we ended up with requests that look like this instead of this. And so now everybody using the API, and this involves the internal developers who are using our internal developers who are using our API, can figure out intuitively what it is that they need from our API. A new media token, media token.add. A list of media, media.list. Sounds really obvious for uh, at an API conference like this, right? And then we created our own REST standards, so we decided to only use get and post uh, to avoid any firewall issues and a bunch of other things that I won't get into now. And then we packaged all this complexity behind our client libraries because developers don't need to know about the inner workings of our API, which was something that was mentioned a whole bunch yesterday. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like. So this is that ugly string request. I don't know why I'm not being. Oh, no. Hold on. To leave PowerPoint for this. 
Can you see that? Okay. So this is that ugly string request that we looked at before. This is actually in our interactive console. I'll get to that in just a bit later. Um, and if you see, the more like filters I add, the longer it gets. And then if I switch over to our Python library, which you might have imagined by now is my favorite language, uh, it's a little bit easier to work with. But client libraries are not just about I wish this would show up. Client libraries are not just about avoiding string requests. Client libraries, very essentially, I know this looks like it says SDKs plus developers equals love, but client libraries are essentially your relationship with your developers, which means that you need to understand very well the psychology of marketing your API as a product, as a very good product, because the end users of that product are developers who are very particular about what they love. Which is why a couple weeks later, Jeff comes back to you and you say, now what, Jeff? We have a client library. And he says, yeah, but our client library is in Python. You say, yeah, our, our APIs in Python, our developers are Python developers. And he says, yeah, but our end users are not. Our end users are developers who prefer very specific methodologies and tools based on the language of their choice. Which is what Kaltura realized when we wrote ours, and we realized no one would want to handle tokenized file uploading in an unfamiliar language. Just because they're developers and they're extra smart doesn't mean they want to work extra hard. They're looking for the path of least resistance. They want to move that task into the done column. If developer Kyle from New York is told by his lead to implement video into, his, into their application and he comes upon our API and we're only offering languages that he doesn't know, he's going to close that tab and he's going to find other options. So what do you do? You, you create another client library. It's probably JavaScript because GitHub says that everyone's using JavaScript. And that's not enough, so you add Java and PHP and then Ruby and C Sharp and C++ and, and, and. You're now bragging about 11, 13, 15 client libraries, and that's really awesome. Until your next API update. And if this is your team of developers, excuse me, if this, if this is your team of developers, about half of them are going to be spending their time making that one change to your API, to your 11 client libraries. And at this point, you're probably thinking, it's fine. We just won't update our client libraries every time we change our API. But of course, you're going to update your client libraries with every change to your API. Because if developer Lisa at a really desirable company in San Francisco stumbles across your API, gets really excited about all your client libraries, sees Ruby, which is her favorite language, and then sees that you haven't updated your client libraries in six months, she is leaving and never coming back. And the loss of Lisa directly implies the loss of that client, which you don't want. So what is the solution? What is the solution to keeping all of your libraries up to date without burning through developer resources? What is the solution to attracting those developers that you want to your API and keeping them there with up-to-date code? Well. There's plenty out-of-the-box solutions. You've probably heard of Swagger. They're actually sponsoring us under SmartBear. Uh, what they'll do is create an open API spec out of your API, and that is basically a frozen snapshot or the standard for defining, producing, visualizing your API. And one of the ways it can do so is by creating the snapshot of your API by calling all of your API endpoints. And you end up with this picture of all objects, operations, authentication methods, licensing, et cetera, et cetera. It looks something like this in YAML and like this in JSON. The next step is then to take this spec and automatically generate a client library, any client library in the language of your choice using that spec. And again, there are plenty of awesome out-of-the-box solutions for this, another, again, one of them being Swagger, um, that will take that snapshot and create these for you. But what if your API is heavier and more complex? What if you're handling workflows and multi-requests? Or what if you just like writing things in-house? Because if you start to mess around with generated code, things can get a little sticky. 
this is the problem that Kaltura faced when we were writing our client libraries, when we wrote a bunch of them, and we realized that every time we update our API, 40% of our developers were working on updating those libraries. Swagger didn't exist at the time, but it would not have been the right solution for us anyway, because generated code tends to impose constraints, and constraints cause poor developer experiences. And we already know how much developers don't like poor experiences. So what we did was we created our own XML schema, complete with enums, object, classes, services, made of our API. I will show you what that looks like, and I'll try not to get into a mess here this time. Here is our XML schema, a little bigger. Um, enums, classes, services, plugins, errors. Each node tells you information about each of those objects, what parameters they take, um, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry. And then we, sorry, and then we created an, uh, a generator that would parse that, a, that XML schema and create libraries in each language that we needed them in. If you look at this diagram, for example, so that star up there, the Kaltura logo, that's our server logic or our API. Right after that is the introspection layer, and that creates the XML. From there, we generate client libraries. Then CI puts them in GitHub where they're tested, and all passing libraries get pushed to the public library, library repo, as well as relevant package managers for Java, Python, Ruby, and PHP. And another really cool recent thing is that uh, we generate actually a Swagger spec out of our XML, and LucyBot, which is a project that we sponsor, takes all that and creates our code, our docs, and our interactive workflows. And now I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so we saw our console before, and I'll go back to that uh, string request that we saw. This is our console. So for example, we have a new uh, eSearch API, and this really allows you to play around and then gives you uh, copy-paste code, which developers love. Um, these are all the objects that I was talking about here and how we kind of spread them out so they're one level. And then my favorite thing about this is the workflows, because we have a lot of um, Steps, for example, uploading media, which is something that's done often in Kaltura that requires a lot of steps. Even I sometimes forget what those steps are. And the workflows, which are generated from that schema uh, and super easy to write, actually walk you through all of those steps that you need uh, in order to complete that workflow. And then gives you code here, which you could copy and paste straight into your application. Now, the really simple and most important awesome part about all of this is that a job runs every night that generates the XML from the API, then the client libraries from the XML, and puts them all in the repo so that developers are always getting the latest and greatest version of our code in one click or no click at all. The generators are all written in PHP. That's how we have them written. And we have them for, they have, they're generating libraries for Java, PHP, Python, Node.js, AngularJS, C-sharp, Ruby, TypeScript and, uh, TypeScript, and Swift, and some other business modeling language. And for each cutting edge new language that comes out, all we need to do is write a new generator. And they're super simple to write. That's what you came to hear about today, right? <laughs> So this is actually an open source project. You can use it yourself. Um, I'll show you the, I'll give you the links later on. But if you come to this page, um, you can either write your own XML schema or use an open API spec. Uh, you could copy, if you were to copy exactly how our schema is written, you could then use the files that you would download from this project. Clicking this would give you three files. You'd end up with these three. First, this is the abstract class. This provides helper functions for generating the libraries. We'll talk about this in a second. This script is what saves the files to disks and tests the library creation to make sure everything's OK. And this template client generator is the meat of the generator. Uh, this is where you have the functions that write the project files, that write enums, write object classes, write services. So you could either implement that first abstract class yourself with your own file that does whatever you need to do based on your spec or your schema and the language of your choice, or you could change this file um, based on your needs. 
Uh, it's super simple, so I'm not really going to get back into it. But obviously, if this is something you're interested in doing, feel free to reach out to me and we could talk about it. However, if writing your own stuff is not for you and you would just like to go the easy way, like I said, there are plenty of really awesome tools um, that you could use to generate your client libraries. But what is important is that no matter what, whatever you're doing, if you have client libraries, it is very important that you have a system in place for updating them, for keeping them updated, because that is a huge part in having an API that is, a trusti that is attractive and trustworthy. And I'm going to break down those steps to finish. One, figure out your API. Determine its complexity, the authentication overhead, how hard that would be without a client library. Then have those conversations with your Jeff about whether you need a client library. How much back and forth will, be, will there be between your developers and your API? What are the most complicated endpoints? How often will they be used? How do I make them easier to manage for my developers? Two, figure out if you want to spec a schema however you want to define your API and define the hell out of it. That frozen shot of your API will help you spot flaws and design patterns. That will help your internal developers help make decisions about what your API should look like. And that will now be the consistent source of truth between you and your users. Because three, that's going to help you generate libraries and generate documentation, generate interactive documentation, and not just any, but up-to-date documentation, which is total gold in the developer world, so that your users don't have to go searching through all of your docs and all of your mess to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. You do all that right, and that's how you build trust. And then Jeff will come back to you, and this time he won't be whining. He's going to tell you about conversions, about developers who read through your docs and then signed up for your platform, about quick turnarounds for integrating APIs, about fewer questions to support that could have been solved with good documentation, about requests for client library languages that are going to be super easy to write. Happy developers, happy you. Because remember, your client libraries are your relationship between you and your developers. And what kind of relationship do you want that to be? You don't want it to be the hard kind where they have to go searching online for answers for, where everything's confusing and unpredictable. You want it to be easy, fun, the type where expectations are defined, predictable responses, a relationship that they rave about to their friends and on social media, or as someone mentioned yesterday, that they wear on a swag t-shirt. You know, the magical stuff of APA fairy tales. Thank you. My email address, our developer portal, and the open source generator project. Thank you.